Hello everyone. On behalf of the Victorian team at the Institute of Architects, I'd like to offer you a warm welcome to today's Lean In. We'll be hearing from Jeff Robinson speaking about past and future learnings from a career in sustainable building design. My name is Stephanie Bullock and I'm from Kosloff Architecture and I sit on the Institute's Victorian Chapter Council and it's my honour to be your host and moderator for today's Lean In session. We're joining from across the country today and we acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of this land. We acknowledge that it is a privilege to stand on country and walk in the footsteps of those before us and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today's Lean In session is being recorded, so if you miss anything today or have to leave early, we'll be publishing this recording on the Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days, and we'll share that link with you in upcoming email communications. This Lean In session enables you to ask questions of our panellists, so if you have a question or a comment, please use the Q&A box down below to add yours in, and we'll go through these with Jeff later on in the session. So today's session features Jeff Robinson, who is a Principal and Sustainability Consultant working in Oricon's Melbourne office. Jeff has worked as a consulting engineer for over 36 years in London, Ireland, and for the last 26 years in Melbourne and overseas. He has an industry-wide reputation as a passionate advocate for great architecture and urban design and the design of net zero carbon, all electric, sustainable and healthy buildings, which meet the passive house standard. Having seen the ability of the construction industry to change to reduce operational carbon, he is now advocating for the industry to reduce operational carbon, and he jointly chairs an Amecla working group, which is focused on transforming the building services supply chain to reduce embodied carbon. Jeff's an experienced Green Star accredited professional and infrastructure sustainability professional, a member of the Well Building Faculty and a Well AP and a Climate Reality Leader. He's also a member of the Property Council's Victorian Sustainable Development Committee and a sustainability specialist on the Victorian Design Review Panel and City of Casey Design Excellence Panel and a board member of the Australian Passive House Association. He's recently finished two terms as a member of the Heritage Council of Victoria and in June 2020, he was selected as one of the GBCA's inaugural Green Star Champions for his work inspiring change across the property industry in Australia. Jeff, welcome to our Lean In. It's great to have you with us. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Uh, thanks for the great introduction, and uh, and thank you for the AIA uh, for um, inviting me to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, which is uh, sustainable buildings and architecture. And uh, I'm joining you today from um, Banarangland in in Hyatt, and um, I um, I'm going to talk to you about. Let's see, get the first slide up. So what I'm going to cover in this webinar, uh, first of all, a little bit about me and my passion for architecture and the design of sustainable buildings. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the key events in the green building movement in Australia um, and some of the green building projects that I've been involved in and some of the lessons I've learned on that journey. And then finally, I'm going to share some thoughts on areas where I think we need to drive change in the Australian construction industry for a more sustainable, healthy and resilient future. And the role that you as architects have in uh, making this happen. And then uh, we're going to have a good Q&A session after that. So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Dublin and um, I took the first degree in building services engineering in, in Ireland. Um, and um, my favorite subjects in that course were building physics um, in passive design and the history of architecture. And that has always uh, stood me very well to help understand why architecture is what it is and why architects do what they do. Um, so I worked for Arup in London from 1986 until 1991. I then came to Ireland and uh, back to Ireland and I started a building services practice for Arup in their Cork office. I then um, started a, in 97, came over to Melbourne and I started a building services practice for Arup in their Melbourne office. And in 2003 joined what was Connell Mac Mac Mott MacDonald and became Oricon in 2009. And I've held various leadership roles then. I won't go into the various other things that uh, Stephanie's introduced me to, but I am a, an active member of a lot of organizations. And um, one of the things that I also really enjoy doing is uh, getting the opportunity to judge 
various uh, industry sustainability awards like the Premier Sustainability Awards, the FMA and uh, the Banksy Awards. So some of the, uh, I think I have been in, in a, at a, a very good time to be uh, designing sustainable buildings in Australia because when I came in 97, um, the, there had already been a sort of a history of uh, environmental sustainability happening in Australia, going back to um, the um, uh, uh, Franklin uh, River, the damming of the Franklin River, or, or the campaign to save that, which then subsequently led to the foundation of the ACF. Um, the, uh, in 1971, between 71 and 74, um, there were 54 green bands led by Jack Mundy in, in New South Wales, and that saved some really important uh, heritage buildings in the rocks and, uh, and also large parts of the uh, Royal Botanic Gardens. So when I arrived in 97, um, there, were the, there was a lot of work happening on the uh, Sydney Olympic uh, Games and um, the, uh, that had been won on the basis, on the promise that it was going to be the Green Games. And certainly a lot of the buildings there were, and a lot of the folk who were working on them were the folk who were early uh, movers in the green building movement in, in Australia. And the lessons learned and skills developed uh, at that time led to the formation of the Green Building Council uh, in 2002, and then subsequently the launch, their launch of their Green Star rating scheme. And then things quickly accelerated because we love competition, we love competing against each other in Australia, and a lot of um, uh, certainly commercial tenants want, uh, and uh, developers wanted to develop their buildings and have Green Star ratings. Um, other influential things, 2010, the Building Disclosure Act uh, required commercial buildings over 2,000 square metres to declare their neighbours' ratings. And that was really important in establishing the neighbours' rating system as the, the performance tool for um, uh, measuring uh, energy, water, waste and indoor air quality performance of buildings in, in, in Australia. And that's since been up exported uh, worldwide to the UK and, and New Zealand and also to um, a, a variation to South Africa. Uh, 2015, the, U, uh, US, uh, the uh, United, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals were published. Uh, the Climate Agreement, uh, Paris Agreement came in 2015. In 2016, the Victorian government committed to a net zero carbon target by 2050. And then last year, finally, uh, the federal government legislates emissions target of 43% and net zero carbon by 2050. And um, there's a huge trend uh, at the moment. Um, the Green Building Council has continued to evolve. And in October 2020, the GBCA uh, published the um, uh, Green Star Buildings tool, the current one, which requires a climate positive pathway. And I think that is leading to a lot of uh, clients who are starting to say, well, how do I deliver that? And what do, what do I have to change to be able to deliver um, very high performance buildings? So um, I'm going to talk to you about a number of the different buildings that I've worked on um, over the last 25 years. And um, there's a few common themes. The first one is a real interest that I have in designing mixed mode buildings, buildings that can be naturally ventilated and that have very, very good passive characteristics, good shading, uh, use of thermal mass. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit then around uh, uh, how I, my thinking has evolved and uh, my interest at the moment in really high performance um, uh, buildings um, using the uh, passive house rating tool. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why, uh, how that helps you to get to net zero carbon. So I'm going to start at the very beginning, as they say. Um, the first, one of the first green projects that I worked in Australia was with Lyons, uh, with Kerry Lyon, on the um, redevelopment, uh, or sorry, no, the development of the Marine and Freshwater Resources Institute in Queenscliff. It was one of about six uh, lab projects that the DPI was doing at that stage um, under the leadership of Franklin Trow. And this was the most amazing project to work on, on a beautiful isthmus uh, between uh, Lonsdale Bight and Swan Bay. Uh, this 
was an old uh, landscape uh, landfill development right next to a la uh, Ramsar uh, protected headland. And this building was very much designed to, you know, blend in with the environment. So it has a, a wonderful grass roof on it. It faces out onto uh, Swan Bay. And you can see at the back of the development, the um, areas where the seawater is collected. And to actually get the seawater for this, um, there was we drilled a, a pipeline uh, right underneath the um, uh, sun, uh, the um, sand hills there, and went right out into the Lonsdale Bight and brought seawater back uh, into the to those tanks. Um, yep. Next. So the building was very much designed to be a, a nat uh, naturally ventilated mixed mode building. Um, the um, uh, facade was designed to be self-shading. Um, it uh, uh, was um, north facing. It had uh, openable windows, uh, top and bottom, to go and encourage natural ventilation into the space. It had a grass roof on it. Um, uh, and we used the thermal mass to um, pre-cool the building at night time and, um, uh, and uh, to moderate temperatures throughout the space. Um, the outside of the building was shaded uh, or, or protected using radially cut timber, and um, uh, it was really designed to be a very low energy, comfortable uh, building. It had uh, skydime roof lights to bring light in deep into the space as well. Um, there was also a great water story on the project. Rainwater is captured from the uh, office roof areas, northern laboratories and courtyard, and it's stored in tanks, and the water is then used to irrigate the grass roof of the building as well as for more critical tasks such as uh, fire supply. Um, the stormwater runoff um, that uh, comes in uh, flows into wetland ponds, uh, where it's treated before it goes into Swan Bay, and the two treatment ponds protect the environment as well as creating a haven for the uh, um, uh, local wildlife. And uh, this was a project I did when I was uh, working for Arab. Uh, another project that I did uh, when I was with Arab was the uh, one of my first um, heritage buildings, which was the re uh, refurbishment of the Bow Repair Centre uh, uh, for the University of Melbourne. Uh, worked on this project with uh, Lovell Chen. And um, this was a wonderful building. It's a 1954 uh, building by Eggleston MacDonald and just an absolute design classic, a beautiful building um, and um, built around the same time as the Olympics. And um, the uh, it had just got a little bit old and, and tired and needed a little bit of love. And we put in a new energy efficient uh, pool heating system. We put in a thermal wheel, which was used to preheat the pool supply air. Um, we it was a problem with condensation on the windows. So we put in a ventilation system, which washes air over the um, uh, facade at low level to uh, reduce condensation. And in the um, uh, gym areas, they were designed with a mixed mode uh, and nighttime cooling system to cool the building down and to naturally ventilate it during the day. And um, it really has excellent uh, daylighting and uh, just a, a wonderful building to be in and with great views from it as well. Um, one of my the first uh, sort of Green Star building I worked on was the very first six star Green Star refurbished building, which was 40 Albert Road in South Mellon. Uh, it was bought by Peter Zentel of, uh, of Zencorp, and he had this vision to go and turn a rather tired 1970s um, building into a really cutting edge uh, sustainable building. And um, so we worked with SJB um, and uh, had a wonderful collaboration on this particular project. We took off the facade on the outside of the building and put in a new facade, put in double glazing, put in some shading on the outside of it. Um, and Peter really wanted this to be a showcase for his business. So um, um, we put in high efficiency dimmable lights and ballasts. We put in a, an integrated um, Occupancy controls for lighting, HVAC, and security. There was a gas VRV uh, air conditioning system, um, which I wouldn't do today, but would probably put, still put in VRV. Um, and the building was designed to be mixed mode. So um, 
we you a um, staircase was put into the building that you can sort of see in the um, uh, try and point with the area there staircase is there and um, air was drawn from both the front and the back of the building through openable windows or land louvers um, came in and was drawn out by the air rising up in this um, uh, stair tower and um, helped naturally ventilate the building and then when it was uh, too hot or too cold the windows were closed down and um, the air conditioning systems came on. Um, there was solar hot water heating, there was um, three PV arrays up on the roof, um, there was daylighting that came into the boardroom areas there and uh, really cutting edge there was a ceramic uh, fuel cell which used gas to generate electricity. Um, a big focus on indoor air quality, uh, as I said it was naturally ventilated, some of the modelling that we did there was a fresh air um, uh, ventilation with air filtration, dry core humidification. Uh, he wanted a very good indoor air quality and uh, low VSC materials were installed. And you can see the top left hand picture um, showed what the building was like before. And the lower one shows the huge difference by you know, bringing in daylighting and putting in glass uh, walls in the offices meant to bring light in. And you can see on the right of the picture, uh, the wonderful, uh, uh, and on the left, bottom left, um, the uh, stair tower, which had a lovely mural in it and encouraged people to use the stairs and walk up. And the top picture shows the meeting room, which had um, uh, natural lighting into it as well. So 96% of the structure was reused and 88% of the facade. And also recycled timber was. And there were a lot of key lessons that came from this particular project. Peter had seen an increase in the asset value of the building. He'd seen uh, improved uh, rental returns, uh, reduced outgoings. Uh, he'd seen um, and had studied all this. Uh, there was higher staff productivity. And certainly he was able to use the building very much uh, for building brand and profile and for new business opportunities. So after that project, the next uh, Green Star project we uh, I worked on with my colleague uh, Peter Matheson was the uh, Bendigo Bank headquarters, uh, this time with uh, Gray Puxand and BVN as the architects, and we were the uh, sustainability consultants. It was the first five-star um, Green Star building in regional Victoria, had a four-and-a-half-star neighbours rating, and um, it was very much designed to create a new precinct in central Bendigo, included some public space and retail areas, as well as Bendigo Bank's head office. And the bank really wanted to reflect um, Australia's best practice. And that's where they were really pushing us to um, achieve a five star green star rating. Um, the some of the key things about the building, it was one of the first buildings in that area to go and have underfloor air conditioning and was done to do that to give very good indoor air quality and also to give individual control to the folk who are in the building and to regulate humidity levels. There were two large atria were designed to bring um, daylight into the workstations and to make sure that all workstations were in eight meters of natural light. And there were individual user controls over artificial lighting through task control on every um, workstation. We also put in a central vacuum system, improve indoor air quality, and also to um, increase carpet life. Um, the energy conservation was through very good passive control. So there was good external shading on the west and north, double glazing in all windows, uh, solar hot water heating, low energy lighting uh, at the perimeter zones and an insulated roof and floor slabs. And because it was Bendigo and because water was in, this was the millennium drought, uh, there was a big focus on uh, uh, reducing water, so we put in, uh, there was a black water plant put into the building, which uh, I don't recommend putting black water plants in individual buildings. They're hard to do, and it has uh, proved to require a lot of maintenance and things. Uh, there was also rainwater collection. Um, the uh, This is uh, one of the atria, um, and we did a lot of modeling to go and see um, you know how much daylighting we would get into the space from the um, the uh, two uh, three atria that were put into the building. Uh, you can see the um, uh, external shading and the views that came from that. So lovely views out over Bendigo, uh, but very good solar control. <laughs> and um, 
uh, you can see there was excellent um, uh, daylighting and views in the space. So some of the lessons from that, uh, the staff really liked the building, particularly the really good indoor air quality and the quiet air conditioning system and individual control. And the buildings maintaining comfort conditions, CO2 levels within an acceptable range. The blinds are used on the west side in the afternoon and are effective. The lighting control systems and task lighting work well. The open space is well used and liked by staff. And the sectoral, central vacuum system is very effective at cleaning and liked by the cleaners. Um, next project I worked on after that was with uh, Ross McGee in, in Spowers. And um, it was uh, one as a result of a design competition for the new Metropolitan Fire Brigade training headquarters. Uh, and it's in, uh, in Burnley. And uh, this was one of the first Green Star uh, rated buildings in, in Victoria. It's a five star Green Star building. And even though the building is, is, is red in color, it's very, very green and sustainable for the time. Um, uh, some of the key features are the um, uh, atria with the curved glazing um, facing north self shading. Uh, and then limiting the amount of solar gain that's coming in, you can see from the windows in the on the rest of the on that facade. So um, this building is uh, one of a series of buildings on the site, and they do a lot of fire training and community uh, industry community education. So lots of water is used, and all of that water was collected and uh, put into um, a, a bio, water treatment by a swale and collector, and uh, the water was collected and then reused. And the building was very much designed on uh, strong passive design principles with the um, walkways and corridors acting as a buffer on the northern side of the building. Um, it had highly insulated facades, it had optimized window to wall ratio. And one of the unusual things is we used a hollow core slab uh, with activated thermal mass. Uh, we used a thing called the uh, Thermodex system, whereby Air is supplied in through the hollow core uh, and passes up and down uh, through the hollow core and then comes into the space. Um, the building was designed with a north-south orientation as a high performance facade. It has four atriums to bring light into the space. It was uh, It is naturally ventilated as part of a mixed mode ventilation system. It's got natural daylighting and exposed thermal mass. Um, we did lots of modeling of the building to go and check that uh, from a CFD point of view, to, to check that the natural ventilation systems would go and work within the building. And you can see um, the uh, there was this uh, buffer space created within the on the northern side with the atria there, which protected the rest of the building. Um, there was very good shading on the um, uh, on, on each facade, appropriate shading. So self-shading on the northern side and then some large shading on the west. You can see this is the inside of the building. You can see the um, uh, 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 exposed thermal mass and you can see some of the louvers, um, uh, the swirl diffusers bringing air into the space. And then similarly, this is what the uh, office spaces were like or are like. Uh, it had, they have high level uh, roof vents, which are automatically controlled uh, to bring um, uh, you as part of a nighttime cooling system. And you can then see the uh, ductwork, exposed ductwork, uh, which is connecting, bringing air in and out of the slab. Um, so some of the and, and learnings from this building, there were some initial challenges around cleanup of the site. Uh, and with respect to the um, uh, operation, um, I think there was, in hindsight, inadequate education of the staff as to how the building worked. There were complaints from staff. Staff had moved from predominantly cellular offices to open plan and from conventional air conditioned offices to mixed mode. And, and the building services were not commissioned for each of the seasons. There were some initial problems with a chiller failing on, under extreme heat. Where that was on the Black Saturday uh, when the Black Saturday fires were on. The building was in operation. Um, and the temperature outside was 47 degrees and the uh, BMS uh, control system needed a little bit of tuning. So uh, an experienced facilities manager, uh, Robin, Robert Houston was appointed. He met with the staff, listened to complaints, communicated uh, uh, solutions and a timeline for rectification. 
gave uh, weekly updates. Staff were educated on how the building was designed to work and the occupants role in operating uh, the building. Uh, the building is maintaining comfortable conditions, even extreme temperatures. That twenty, Even on that, when the chiller failed on Black Saturday and the, when the temperature was 47 degrees outside, the temperature never got over 27 degrees inside because of the uh, exposed thermal mass and also the, um, the uh, really good uh, facade on the building. Staff like to open the windows and bring in fresh air. Lighting control systems were working well for daylighting and glare control and staff are using uh, stairs instead of lifts for interfloor mo floor movement. Um, oh, sorry, I missed this one. The, so some of the other kind of key lessons are you need, must understand the culture of an organization. Um, you need to thoroughly commission and test all systems prior to occupation. Explain how the green building will work prior to and straight after occupation and the occupant's role. Good facilities management is essential and where things go wrong, communicate and explain how and where the problems are being solved. Plan your monitoring and controls process and uh, mixed mode exposed thermal mass uh, buildings bring robust, stable, comfortable conditions for occupants. Um, so the next project I worked on uh, was a uh, not a mixed mode building, it's uh, 717 Burke Street, but it was a, a project that was, uh, um, again, five star green star. It was uh, a whole of precinct project because it had uh, 37,000 uh, square meter of those offices, uh, 3,000 square meters of boutique offices, retail, car parks and a four star hotel. Um, developed by... Um, uh, Melbourne Civic City and the architects on this were uh, Meteor 3 and it was built by ProBuild. And you can see the, the site here, uh, the two buildings, the hotel and the office building. Um, you can see the, the roof of the two atrium is at the top. And uh, this is prior to the building of Medibank and NAB. So this is what Docklands looked like before those, uh, those buildings went up. So early days. Um, and this was very much a building of its time. At this time, uh, Cogen was all the go, um, and it seemed like the, the right thing to go and do. Um, the uh, electricity we were using in Victoria was um, uh, generated by dirty black coal, and um, or brown coal, actually, even worse. And um, so there was a real trend in the industry at the time to, to go towards Cogen, I think. In hindsight, that was a mistake, um, and a lot of those cogents were were turned off. But for this particular project, we put in a 1.1 megawatt uh, cogen plant, and we used the waste heat uh, being supplied to the hotel for hot water. We put in a big central uh, hot water uh, storage system to collecting water from the roofs. Um, we treated storm water before it went out, put in a big central bicycle store for the whole of the precinct, and put in central waste and recycling facilities. Uh, the building and uh, the architects were looking for floor to ceiling glass, and but they also wanted uh, high levels of performance. So we did a lot of uh, work in modeling, looking at um, uh, low E coated fritted glass, which gave uh, good solar control, um, but also um, uh, good daylighting and views. Uh, again, the system we used for this building was an underfloor system because of the low energy, uh, good indoor air quality and um, individual control that you get and the ability to uh, very flexible for future churn. And you can see some of the ductwork at low level. It had very, very good zoning in the building, had a, a big focus on uh, really good indoor air quality. Um, uh, the building had the kind of uh, low PVC um, usage, use of plantation timber and low cement concrete, good access to daylight and views, high levels of fresh air, low VOC carpets, and we did a lot of thermal modeling on the building. The next, back to my uh, uh, earlier theme of mixed mode buildings, this was uh, lifestyle working. Uh, which we did with um, uh, the developer was Lendlease Development with the Stable Group and the architects were Nettleton, Nettleton Tribe. 
And um, this is uh, right beside our offices in Docklands. It's a lovely mixed mode building. Um, you can see um, basically there's a big central courtyard in the building. Um, there, it's strata offices. So each of the individual offices has their own VRV air conditioning unit. They have their own naturally ventilated space. Um, and I've just seen that my uh, battery is running low. So I'm just going to plug in a battery and swap over. So sorry about this. One second. Oops. Yep. Just while um, Jeff's doing that, just a reminder that if you have questions, please pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom um, because we'll be going through that towards the end of the session as well. So we might have temporarily lost connection with Jeff, so just bear with us and we'll just um, work that out in the next minute or so. And great to see some questions coming through as well. Hi everyone, we're just um, getting Jeff back online. So again, thanks for your patience, just bear with us. Hi, Jeff. I think you're just on mute. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I, uh, the, my battery went flat. I do apologize. I'll just resume now. Hang on a second. Yeah, okay. Yeah, cool.
Okay. Uh, sorry, just trying to see where. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, we can see it, Jeff. If you can just go to full screen. Okay, so go to, oops. Might be one of those um, buttons down the bottom. Uh, share. Uh, is that sharing now? Uh, that's perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, great. Um, so the um, apologies for that. Uh, so lifestyle working, um, and can I just check the screen at the moment? Is it showing lifestyle working, Collins Street, PVRA? Yep, spot on. Perfect, great. Okay, so um, the uh, this building has, as I said, was designed uh, to uh, as strata offices. Each of the offices had an individual air conditioning system, so the people had control of both their natural ventilation, and they also had half of them also had the ability to have their own PV array. So uh, power was being generated on the um, uh, for them as well. So they had renewable power, individual air conditioning control, and uh, they could um, uh, control natural ventilation. So a lot of control in the space. There was also a lot of work done in looking at um, the uh, uh, shading on the outside of the building. A lot of work was done to um, get a very good shading system. This is the front entrance to the building. Uh, when you go in, there's uh, a whole load of uh, sky bridges that people can um, uh, meet, sit on and, and, and get around the building. And there's also excellent daylighting that comes into the atrium. Uh, you can see some of the different spaces that are uh, here. Uh, things I wouldn't do in the building again. Um, there was a number of the uh, the windows were designed as louver windows, and um, it's very very hard to be able to get good um, air tightness control on those ones there. So I wouldn't do that. I do it as mixed mode, but not as uh, um, um, uh, with louver windows. And this is just some of the shading on the outside of the building that you can see. Um, the next project uh, that I worked on was the uh, Melbourne School of Design with John Wardle and Nada uh, Architects. Uh, uh, Oricon were doing the building services design and ULA were the EST consultants. And this was a fantastic project to work on. Six star green star building. Um, a, uh, and a building again, going back to that theme of mixed mode natural ventilation. Um, so it was designed um, using very strong principles, uh, uh, very much around the built pedagogy, a, um, uh, the design studio, um, and uh, very much as a living laboratory. Um, and you can see the kind of principles that went into the building here. It was designed uh, with displacement ventilation uh, being supplied at low level within the atrium. Each of the individual uh, the offices on either side of the building and the studios were naturally ventilated um, and uh, the atrium helped, the hot air in the atrium helped drive air, uh, um, rising air went out and it was helped naturally ventilated. But at the times when it was too hot or too cold, uh, there were uh, individual fan call units in the different rooms that would come on. Um, the very, very good passive design on the building on the um, north, uh, west and east facades. There was a, a veil there. The orange bit in the middle is the heritage facade, which was retained. And you can see the daylighting in the space. Um, a detailed modeling was used to refine the facade and daylight performance. And uh, there was excellent daylighting for the studios hall and majority of the workspaces. 
and uh, also great daylighting down into the basement as well and into the center parts uh, uh, the atrium space with the hanging uh, studios uh, this shows the, the plant was located down in the basement and then supplied up at low level in the atrium and extracted in the space and these are the individual studios where you see the fan coil units the louver at high level is used for um, uh, uh, automatically that opens when it's suitable air is drawn through there goes out to another louver that uh, goes into the atrium and then drawn out at high level within the space and then reversing that when it's when it closes down um, a lot of modeling was done to go and uh, see uh, the percentage of uh, time that the buildings could be naturally ventilated and uh, the facade transfer forms according to particular needs of the orientation, the oblique key views. And there was a lot of work done to kind of parametrically model the uh, shading systems on the outside. Um, and uh, the uh, natural ventilation system works really well. Uh, there was a large water tank, 750 uh, litres of water, and that water is used for toilet flushing and cooling towers. Um, also uses low water use taps, urinals and chairs. Um, the building is very much a uh, teaching and learning building, so its living lab is part of the pedagogy, so it exposed uh, uh, structure and services, and uh, also had a, um, you know, you can see the um, I, um, uh, staircases, the exposed structure there. Um, building achieved a, a six star green star building and got uh, 10 out of 10 innovation points. Uh, next building that I uh, worked on was the uh, another one for the University of Melbourne, another one with Wardles, which was the Ian Potter South Bank Centre. And this was the first building that we went on, uh, worked on, that was all electric. Uh, so it's a new performance and education building, uh, eight levels, ninth level being planned. Uh, we had a very, very big focus on uh, strong, sustainable design principles. Um, we were trying to use the fact that the building required um, uh, had particular characteristics that lended themselves to be a sustainable building. So there were strong synergies between great uh, acoustics and sustainable design. Um, it supports the campus with zero uh, with a, a zero carbon twenty thirty strategy. Um, when you are trained to be a world class musician, can be quite stressful. So the space is needed for relaxation, and biophilic connection, and socialization. Musician other instruments are are sensitive to temperatures and humidity, so we wanted to have a um, you know well controlled tight envelope um, for better acoustics and downsizing mechanical uh, plant. And we can see some of the kind of the characteristics here: the PVs up on the roof. Um, the underfloor air conditioning system in the large acoustic spaces, um, the really good solar control in the different spaces, the good daylight in the atrium that brings light into the center of the building. Um, other characteristics, uh, great char sustainable characteristics of the building here, um, a very uh, use of natural timber. So a lot of um, uh, timber used within the building a sheltered courtyard on the outside of the building and great bike facilities for the for the rest of the precinct. Um, and um, obviously with uh, it was important to control the amount of air coming into the building as well. So there was a, a big focus on the um, uh, having um, uh, control of um, drafts when people are coming into the building. Um, so some of the key ESD strategies, um, a big focus on making the building airtight, um, and it was pressure tested, um, displacement ventilation in the large spaces, rooftop photovoltaics, um, heat pumps and high efficiency chiller was used for heating hot water and chiller plant. And uh, there was um, very low velocity uh, ductwork, which was good for energy efficiency and also for noise. Um, the, uh, what was interesting about the building is at the time when it was finished, 2015, um, it was uh, very much set for the future, being all electric, but at the time 
it was being powered by you know black power in the um uh victorian grid so it would actually the co2 emissions because of that were high but shortly after that the university um negotiated a uh, power purchase agreement and uh, which is um, supplies green power for the uh, campuses. Um, so there were a lot of good lessons learned from this building on how you design the plant. There was also a lot of PVs put on uh, photovoltaics, which also contribute um, something 13% uh, to the annual generation. Um, let's check in on time. Um, we a uh, couple of other buildings that we worked on um monash uh, university's chancery building um uh, with uh, this was designed using passive um house design principles so a high performance facade with um external shading on the outside of the building um and uh, very good um uh, because we had a high efficiency envelope we were able to uh, have very um, uh, all electric plant again, and um, and make that quite small because of the efficient facade. And you can see that the sort of plant sizes that we put in were quite small because of the efficient facade and uh, insulation systems. Now, the they, um, Monash uh, Chancery building didn't. Uh, Achieved passive house rating, got very close, but uh, didn't quite get there on the air tightness test. I think it was about one air change. This building here, which is the Monash Woodside Building for Technology and Design, um, their engineering building is uh, the largest passive house building in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we had the joy of working with Grimshaw on this building. Um, uh, we did all the engineering and ESD on the building, and Lendley built the building. I forgot to mention that uh, we worked with uh, ARM on the Chancery building, which was a lot of fun, and it was built by Kane. Uh, this building here is a cathedral to engineering. Uh, it is a uh, um, designed uh, five-story building, nearly uh, 20,000 square meters. Uh, it's got five levels, nearly 3,000 occupants and has very, very efficient uh, all-electric uh, mechanical systems and a heat recovery system in the building and a large PV thing on the roof. One of the key learnings from this was if you want to deliver high-performance buildings, um, I would strongly recommend you look at an integrative design process where the engineers and the architects work incredibly collaboratively right from the start. Um, uh, design workshops were informed by research modeling and analysis and we worked very very closely with um, uh, Grimshaw uh, to deliver a very well insulated airtight building and then subsequently with land lease to build it. Um, so here are some of the key design principles, this diagram produced by Grimshaw, PV panels on the roof, high performance envelope, uh, skylights in the uh, atria, a layered internal space, rainwater collection, reuse, and high performance services. Uh, and you can see here is the kind of uh, the different principles of high performance glazing, a lot of insulation, a big focus on air tightness, thermal bridging, and a, um, a heat recovery ventilation system. As an example of the external shading systems on the building, and you can see the five atria which are bringing daylight into the space. And you can also see the solar control systems which went in on the top of the um, uh, atria to go and control the amount of solar gain that came in whilst getting, letting a lot of daylight in. Um, there was a lot of modeling done using uh, to look using the passive house uh, planning package and also uh, thermal modeling. Um, the building was very much a living laboratory, so it has uh, thermal piles and uh, you know the students can do experiments on that in the uh, it's got underfloor um, uh, heating in the um, uh, some of the common areas on there that's on display as well and the BMS system is open for integration it's got very efficient uh, uh, heat pumps and uh, high efficiency condensers on the roof and uh, a very large PV array um, a lot of work was done on making sure that that was and not self-shading and use very high efficiency panels. 
Um, and a lot of this thing comes down to uh, having strong collaboration. We had a great relationship with um, the builder, uh, Len Lease, who did uh, great work, um, got all the teams uh, uh, focused on understanding the air tightness requirements and what the responsibilities are and had a, an on-site air tightness champion who would go around and take a lot of photographs and uh, make sure that the detailing was correct. And there was, uh, I remember we during lockdown when the final testing was done and uh, the results came in and uh, there was a massive cheer from the consultants, the architect and the contractor to cheer that we'd uh, uh, achieved a passive house rating for this um, uh, large, large building in. Uh, and I think uh, the lessons from this building are equally applicable to a lot of commercial buildings now. And we're certainly applying passive house principles to a lot of the buildings we're working on. Um, final project that I'm going to just talk about is the new uh, students precinct, uh, which I worked on with Lions and uh, um, uh, all, all of the other collaborating architects who worked on that project, which was wonderful. Um, this was a very collaborative project. Um, we had co-design workshops with the design team and with the uni, uh, design team workshops with the uh, students to uh, co-designed the sustainability aspects with them. It was very much a signature project for the Reconciliation Action Plan, and they had the uh, Living Pavilion, which uh, we all learned a lot about um, uh, the Indigenous history of the site. Uh, the buildings here, uh, one of the key things that came out of the students is they wanted to, them to be high-performance buildings, so the two new buildings are six-star, green-star, and the others are five-star. Um, and these are a lot of the initiatives that came from the thing. There was a very big focus on circular economy, uh, green buildings. There were, all, there were some very large rainwater tanks that were put in to collect and reuse water. And um, we're uh, a lot of work on reducing waste. Um, there was also uh, some of the initiatives that continue to go. Uh, so, uh, they've got rid of single use plastics by using uh, having a good washing up service. Um, they've got uh, really good food choices for vegan food and various other things like that, which reduce emissions. Um, indigenous planting, um, which represents the 45 indigenous language groups and indigenous uh, kitchen garden as well. Um, and this is a project that wasn't a um, last one I'm going to mention is um, wasn't a design uh, project that I was involved in, but one which I did with the Heritage Council and I put it up for a bit of publicity. It's basically a study and work we did over the last three years to look at how we could help existing heritage building owners and custodians with the um, uh, to understand what the impacts of climate change could be. And so we looked at vulnerability assessments and vulnerability charts that could be used for different types of heritage buildings and, and also 10 different case studies. So if you get a chance, and you're interested, check out the Heritage Council website and uh, all of this material can be downloaded. Uh, a wonderful project to work on. So the kind of key lessons that I, uh, and I again, apologies for the uh, um, stuff up on um, my computer running flat, but the kind of key lessons that I would like to um, uh, share that I think areas where we need to change. So I think we really need to step up in the building code to deliver comfortable and healthy buildings to our rapidly heating climate. Um, I think a lot of the buildings we are in are not fit for purpose. And the fact that a lot of folk in Victoria, if you look on them on a Zoom call, they're all wearing puffer jackets, says that the heating and cooling is not necessarily adequate in buildings. And we need to increase the level of insulation and air tightness standards and require man mandatory pressure testing of buildings. We need to adopt a climate positive, uh, uh, a climate appropriate architecture and stop building glass boxes. Um, we, I've certainly found that Passive House is a really excellent tool for helping both designers and contractors uh, to deliver net zero um, carbon buildings. Uh, we need to stop using gas and uh, electrify everything, adopt circular economy design principles and uh, minimize um, embodied carbon in construction. I think that's a huge area, which is why I got involved in the Materials and Embodied Carbon Leaders Alliance, MECLA. And uh, if you're interested, uh, please reach out because it's a, an area where we really have to swing the industry around. And I think we can. 
And then the last thing I, I would uh, uh, that I try to practice is embracing regenerative design, designing for both people and planet. Sorry, the last bit of the uh, presentation was a bit of a rush, but uh, if there's time, I'd love to take some questions. Thank you so much, Jeff. That's a, an extraordinary um, survey of projects and some truly exceptional architecture. Um, we've got a lot of questions, which I doubt we'll get to all of them. Um, if we don't get to your question, I'm sure Jeff would be more than happy for you to reach out directly to him. Anytime. Um, so the first um, first question, uh, you use the term mixed mode quite a lot, um, Jeff. Would you mind just expanding on that a little bit, little bit? What do you mean by mixed mode? So what I mean is that rather than a building just having a... a uh, a um, an air conditioning system where you can't open the windows um, I, the building has got an air conditioning system that can heat and cool the building but it's also designed that the building can be naturally ventilated. Perfect, thanks so much. Another question um, about a huge issue in the industry is about how do you manage responsible disposal of waste material during demolition and construction? That is uh, not easy. Um, I think it requires a lot of careful planning up front and a lot of early conversations with the contractors that you're going to bring on board and really good systems uh, put in place. I think more and more what we actually need to be doing is designing, as I mentioned in my kind of final points, for the circular economy. So we're actually reducing the amount of waste that we're putting in buildings. But um, I think that uh, really thinking about where you can, you know, uh, where you can dispose waste um, and, and minimizing that as much as possible is um, what I look at for individual particular projects and, and particularly trying to design out um, uh, waste if you can and, you know, to reuse as well if possible. Um, one of the projects you mentioned uh, early on in the presentation was Bendigo Bank and you yep. said that maintenance issues on the Blackwater plant. Is it still in use or is it being decommissioned? That's actually a very good question. I, I When I checked a while ago, it was still in use, but I you've actually prompted me to go and find out. I will and, and find out, but I, I don't recommend now. Uh, you know, if I think about some of the, the mega trends that we're seeing in the industry, I think it was a little bit of... Um, fadism at a certain times like a, a very big focus on technology so things like putting in cogen plants and blackwater plants and uh, i didn't point out but on the say for instance bending the a and z bank headquarters they had things like wind turbines so there was a kind of a focus on gimmicky technology now I think blackwater treatment plants are appropriate, but at a precinct level, somewhere like Brangaroo, on an individual level, like um, 833, um, you know, the NZ headquarters, or the Bendigo Bank quarters, the maintenance on these things is, is a lot. So I, I wouldn't recommend them. And similarly, cogen plants, I wouldn't recommend putting them in anymore. Uh, um, and I think more and more, what I'm seeing is, um, the big bang for buck comes from if you can really get the envelope right and um, really use that to go and reduce the size of the the plant in there and, and get um, uh, um, focus on both uh, comfort and also on reducing the amount of energy that you need and also the size of the plant. Right. Um, maybe a related question. Um, so you mentioned um, along with those some other things that were a trend at the time but perhaps weren't um, the best investment. Is there anything at the moment that's getting a lot of um, or taking up a lot of new space or is sort of trendy at the moment that you wouldn't necessarily pursue or you think is, is still to be proven? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I can't think of anything directly at the moment, um, but I, I'd rather turn the question around the other way to see where I see the value coming. And I'll emphasize again that if you uh, a, a focus on architects and engineers working together to get better envelope performance is what I think is 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 part of the secret sauce to deliver high comfort, low energy buildings. I, I can't think of anything straight off the bat on that. Um, no, I'm not not at the moment. Sorry. 
bit of a controversial question. Um, another question, um, so you mentioned Passive House on quite a few of the projects. Do you think those design principles work equally well in all climates, for example, in, in very warm or hot climates? Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, if you've got a very, very, very hot climate and um, what are you trying to do? Uh, you're trying to go and provide shading on the outside of the building, you're trying to control the amount of solar gain that comes into the building. You want the building to act as a bit of an esky. I think there's a kind of a little bit of a, 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 a thought that if you've got a passive house building, it can't be a mixed mode, naturally ventilated building. It can be. And so if you value those times where you want to naturally ventilate as well, um, that can certainly happen. But where um, when it's really, really hot um, or in Victoria, when it's really, really cold, to be able to go and have a well insulated airtight build, building which is very which has got mechanical ventilation in it as well is incredibly valuable right and you've managed to beautifully answer a number of questions in your answers jet and we might just do one one final question i guess holistically you've had an extraordinary career and worked on some amazing buildings looking back um on your time is there anything that you would have done differently yourself in terms of your career um Look, I think there's. Uh, I've I've really enjoyed. Um, uh, uh, Victoria is an amazing place to work. I've really enjoyed working with so many brilliant architects and uh, fellow professionals and builders. And um, I wouldn't change too much. I think some of the things I I, I would um, focus a lot more now on um, build quality and 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 fabric rather than you know gimmicky things like cogen plants and, and and things like that but and i think what what's amazing now what's fantastic is some of the design tools that we have and were really emerging when i started working in australia in 97 some of the you know parametric modeling tools that we can use to optimize facade uh, performance where you can optimize daylighting, energy, um, comfort, or, you know, a whole load of things at the same time there and, and to do it real time and to work collaboratively with architects to do that. That's uh, a huge enabler. Um, but I think good buildings come from having great clients with a vision, an architect and architects and engineers working really, really collaboratively and closely together. And then building great relationships with builders to actually deliver on that kind of performance and when that happens it's amazing um, and you know projects like uh, monash woodside and um you know new students precinct and um school of design and um uh, chancery are all examples of great collaboration on those kind of projects as well so uh, i wouldn't change too much i've I, I, I really enjoy what I what I do and I look forward to continuing to contribute to to the industry now. I think the last thing I would say is that probably the one thing that I learn is once you deal with one issue, you still have to move on to the next. And and the big issue at our time at the moment is the, I think, the issue of embodied carbon and how we, you know, how we deal with that. And I think some of the initiatives that we're now looking at in terms of using more timber construction um you know the work uh, around reducing um steel uh, the embodied carbon and steel and concrete and aluminium uh, at an industry level through organizations like mecla that's the next the the big work that needs to be that that done and i think the other area is really really focusing on build quality and also on healthy buildings you know there's no point in saying okay well we're going to have lots and lots of insulation in houses and we're going to get all that right and if you don't make sure that the the buildings you know say there's something like a, vent, a mechanical ventilation system or something like that to make sure that there's good indoor quality so it's about balancing all of these things and getting them all right together but you know one of the wonderful things about australia is that we are fast followers once we get an idea we execute and we execute well and we execute quickly so i very much look forward to uh, working with many of the people on this call, hopefully in the next few years.
Fabulous. Thank you so much for your time today, um, Jeff. It was an incredible kind of presentation. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining as well. And a reminder that these lean-ins are recorded, so you can view them later, and you'll get notifications of when new lean-ins are available to view by subscribing to the AIA's YouTube channel, YouTube at Oz Architects. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.